It's the 4th of July. We hope you're celebrating the birth of our country by blowing up a small piece of it. I'm Matt Robus, and this is the Balance of Power Roundtable. We are part of the Beyond Politics podcast, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, on the Blue Amp channel on YouTube, which we hope you've subscribed to. We hope you've subscribed to all of this. We hope you're enjoying a relaxing 4th of July with your family, not too startled by constant firecrackers and cherry bombs and... I don't know what else. Why do we blow things up to celebrate our country, Alicia Preston? Oh, I should introduce Alicia Preston, our conservative commentator, analyst, and consultant, along with former U.S. Congressman Paul Hodes. Alicia, are you into blowing stuff up? I love pretty festive fireworks. I live at a tourist beach. They put them on once a week. I'm not sure why they need to be let off by some wahoo at three in the morning. I'm not sure what we're celebrating at three in the morning. I'm just not sure I understand what we're being festive about at that time of day. Because according to the gurus on Fox News, the Constitution says that if we restrict any part of your ability to explode things, shoot things, or otherwise cause mayhem, we have become worse than Stalin. Paul Hodes, have you had a relaxing 4th of July so far? Oh, yeah. Um, I just came back from a couple of weeks away in the middle of the Pacific on an island where the palm trees sway and the wahini wear grass skirts. And I've arrived plunked down on the Atlantic coast to find myself awake at the hour that we're recording this show. I think we have to start with this really increasingly wild story coming out of Colorado. So the Supreme Court had a rush of decisions, as they always do at the end of their term. Among them was the 303 creative case, which pitted the uh, rights of free speech versus uh, a law passed in Colorado trying to oppose discrimination. What it basically came down to, uh, apparently, was that a website designer said that she did not want to design a wedding website for a same-sex couple that were getting married. And the court decided in favor of the website designer. And that seems fairly straightforward, except there's a little wrinkle here. It turns out, first of all, that the website designer never actually designed websites. She said that someday she might start a business that would design websites. And as part of the case, she said that she had received an inquiry for prospective website services at some point in the future, should she choose to provide website design services from a dude, if I get this right, Stuart wanted to marry Mike. It turns out an intrepid reporter tracked down Stuart. Stuart is not marrying Mike. Stuart has been married to a woman for 15 years. They have a child together. He's not gay. Also, he himself is a web designer and he would have no need of getting web design services for his non-existent gay marriage because he would not want someone else to design his website, especially someone who is not actually in the business of creating websites. And all of this raises the question, did we all get played here? Alicia, we were had, right? Now, first of all, that email inquiry website, it was an inquiry through her website wasn't included in any of the filings with the Supreme Court. It was only included as a message in the original lawsuit in 2016 in follow-up documentation because that email inquiry came in, and it's documented as such, the day after she filed her original lawsuit and the day after the media reported on it. Anyone with common sense knows it was a prank. Someone pranked her, but it was not part of the merits of any of the cases that went forward. It wasn't used as to whether she had standing by the dissent or the majority. Look, Paul's the lawyer here. It is something called a pre-enforcement challenge of a law, and it is very common and can be done all the time. If a law passes and you think that law is not constitutional, it doesn't have to be enforced upon you to be able to challenge the law. And that's what was done here. But she is not an injured party. You don't have to be. You can just question the constitutionality of the law. You say, I might want to be a web designer. And if I do, though, I would have to go against this law. I need a pre-enforcement challenge to the law to let me do it. All right, Paul, I'm going to have to have a legal explanation here because under the version of this that Alicia's putting forward, which could be right, it would seem like Rosa Parks would not have actually had to have gotten arrested. She could have merely said, hey, I would like to ride in the front of the bus like every other American, so I'm going to pre-challenge this law. Is Neil Katyal was saying 
that no, this is in fact a constitutional problem here, that there is not an injured party, there is not someone withstanding to challenge it. But what is your sense? Or are you still hearing sea breeze kind of wafting mm-hmm. through palm trees? Yeah, the quick down to dirty pina colada analysis of this issue is there ought to be a real plaintiff, a real defendant a real issue with real people with a real problem in order for the Supreme Court to really consider it. And generally, there are are some extraordinary cases where a state Supreme Court might be able to certify some question to the Supreme Court for some kind of opinion. But there ought to be real people involved. Look wait, at the analysis wait. from liberal liberal think tanks are saying they don't agree with the result of the Supreme Court. They think it was a misguided piece, but the idea that she didn't have standing is flawed. Well, and noted that even, even in the dissent, her standing has never been questioned. Let's move past that. Here you have a business that is a business and it's offering services. Except it's not a business not offering services. Just have to point that out. Let's accept Alicia's uh, take on this. Paul is suggesting we take the economist's approach to this. There's an old joke among economists. What do a couple of economic students do if it's midnight and they're hungry? Assume a pizza. So let's assume a business. I'm assuming a pizza. I'm assuming the pizza. Okay. Assume that this is a business. And what she wants is the right to discriminate. That's what she wants. Never mind that the Constitution and the entire raison d'etre of the United States is all are created equal, that the Constitution ought to guarantee equal opportunity. We're in a country where gay marriage is legitimate. It's been legitimized at the federal level. And now we are giving the right to discriminate against businesses. We're giving them the right to discriminate. That seems to me to be un-American. We have opened the door with this Supreme Court decision. I disagree with the decision. I think it's wrong. I think it's bad for America. Hold aside the question of the ruling itself, because I think there are legitimate arguments in terms of free speech. It is a little bit different, the type of service you're providing. And in this case, it's an expressive service. I'm with you, Paul. I would have ruled the other way if I were on the Supreme Court. But I think that there is at least a reasonable discussion to be had. My concern here is that we've got a case based on a non-existent business. It's someone who was pretending as if they might be a web designer. We all agree with that. This is not someone who was actually in business. So this was a concocted scheme with a pretty right-wing advocacy group to come up with, here is a potential case, let's do this. And it was ruled on in a kind of imaginary sense from a group of justices under the most severe ethics controversy in the history of the Supreme Court. This is not a good look for America. Here we are on the 4th of July. I believe in the the strength of the judicial system, the judicial branch, and the Supreme Court. It is critical to the functioning of America. And so what I'm worried about is support for the Supreme Court, popularity and approval of the Supreme Court, and the willingness of the American public to accept Supreme Court decisions. These are all at all-time lows in polling. And so what I'm concerned about is the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. The legitimacy of the Supreme Court is only being questioned because people are misrepresenting, A, what this ruling is, and B, the idea that a person doesn't have standing to challenge a law before they break it. Look, my day job is I'm a lobbyist. I turn down clients all the time because I don't believe in their cause. I've been asked if I would work to do red flag laws, and I am pro-Second Amendment. I'm not necessarily pro-anti-red flag law, but I didn't want to get into that mix because it's not something I want to walk into. I have been asked to get involved in union issues for the state, the right to work issues. I don't want to get into that mix. If I'm pro-life and someone asks me to advocate for a pro-choice piece of legislation, no one can make me use my speech to advocate for something I don't want to. It doesn't matter what it is. In this woman's case, she says she's an evangelical Christian and she's opposed to gay marriage. She has every right to be opposed to gay marriage. 
She doesn't have the right to refuse service in a retail store because you're not participating in something. But you can't make someone use their own voice, their own speech to advocate for something they don't support. Every right granted to us in this country is granted to us right up until the moment it infringes on someone else's. And that's what this case is about. I think it's a very American case. You can't force someone to use their speech. And the fact that it's about gay marriage is just such a hot button issue. And the fact that the left wants to call everyone on the right a bigot and see this is proof, this is proof. No, this is proof of what the Constitution says, that your rights extend to my, until the moment they infringe upon mine. They're not talking about selling a product. Let's use the baker one because we've been through this one 40 times in the last 10 years. You own a bakery. Someone goes in and wants to buy a muffin. You have to sell them that muffin no matter what. Someone goes in and says, I want you to design. I want you to use your art. I want you to use your expression. I want you to use your voice to work and participate in something that you don't agree with. At that moment, the person doesn't have to participate. It's in there. It's not a fine line. It's a pretty big gap. The difference between making someone participate. Do you, Paul, think that I should have to go out there and advocate to get rid of the 24-week abortion ban in New Hampshire? I support it. Should I have to be required because otherwise I'm stunting someone else's speech? I do think that there is a difference here between public accommodations, which we have a long history of law going back to Woolworth's countertops, right? In your example, if I go in and I want to buy a muffin and someone doesn't like the cut of my jib and they're like, you look pretty Jewy there, Matt, which I am. Okay, we agree. That is a situation where, no, this is a public accommodation food, lodging. I have the right to be in this place. I have the right, I invoked Rosa Parks before, I have the right to be in this place on an equal basis with everyone else. And I think what the court is trying to balance in this case is it gets a little different when you're talking about an expressive business where you are being compelled to use speech. Now, again, I'm just saying that I think that there is a reasonable argument. I also think it's relevant. I do not believe that questions should be settled by referendum in this country. I think referendum is the stupidest way to settle questions. But I do think that in the Dobbs decision, there was a lot of discussion about what is the role of public opinion? What happens when the court makes a decision that is far outside the mainstream of public opinion? Should that matter? So just for context, the New York Times did a review of all of the major rulings of the Supreme Court this term alongside their most recent polling on the question underlying it. And in this case, what you find is that it's a 49-51 split with 51% of Americans saying such a law violates business owners' rights to free speech. This feels like the kind of ruling where there is a, a pretty split opinion in America and a, at least a legitimate argument on each side. Now, I want to contrast that question with the larger slate of rulings that we saw come down in the last week or so, because there have been some pretty consequential rulings. Affirmative action, President Biden's student loan plan, the Voting Rights Act ruling, and of course, the independent state legislature theory ruling on the ability of state courts to constrain state legislatures when it comes to federal elections. Paul, is when you look at the entire slate of rulings, does this feel like a court that is veering far right and outside the mainstream of public opinion? Uh, on average, this court is veering very far right as we feared they would. However, there are notable exceptions. Apparently, there is some fuzzy line that the court will not cross as represented by the independent state legislature theory case, which stands out to me in this general march to the right, or shall I say goose step to the right by the United States Supreme Court. The independent state legislature theory stands out because that would have simply brought down our democracy. It's just too obvious that the threat to democracy from the independent state legislature theory was so whacked out that they couldn't go. So if that's a saving grace, then I salute grace and thank the Supreme Court for saving it. But other than that, this Supreme Court is, is doing harm to the rights of Americans.
I think that the Supreme Court has shown that they are very common sense. Look, the case Paul's talking about North Carolina was basically a Republican legislature said we can do what we want. We get to run federal elections as we want, including drawing lines. And no, a court doesn't have jurisdiction over us, which is preposterous. Of course, every branch of government has to have another branch of government that checks over them. That is the most basic and fundamental schoolhouse rocks little cartoon from when we're in third grade. I can't believe it had to go to the Supreme Court, but that was a common sense decision. The decision on Biden student law. People are like, oh, my God, the court, rich people want to take away money from poor people trying to get college educations. All the ruling said is Biden can't do it unilaterally. He can't do it unilaterally. That's the job of Congress. Adam Schiff is like losing his mind on social media since that came out. And I just kept tweeting back to him, pass a bill, pass a bill. That's what that's supposed to happen. Go pass a bill that says you forgive student debt if you want to do that. All it says is Biden doesn't have the jurisdiction. Alicia Preston Xanthopoulos, you conservative. I agree with you. First of all, I do actually agree with Paul. The sneaky, most important ruling of this entire term was the independent state legislature theory, which in essence would have allowed Republican dominated legislatures to, it's like the South Park joke, whatever, I do what I want. They could have literally done anything they want. And they're showing the propensity to try and do that. They are trying to test, as Alicia was saying with this creative website, they're trying to test the court with increasingly wacky laws to restrict voting rights and to try to shape the electorate in the direction that they want. Alicia, the basic principle that you laid out is so spot on. That's the easy way to think about government. The founders, if it came down to one idea, it's every branch of government has someone looking over their shoulder who can check them. If that had gone the way that the conservatives wanted to and the way that Alito and Thomas and Gorsuch wanted it to go, apparently, because they are nut jobs, then we would have had a prescription for chaos in America. And it would have quickly unwound a lot of the functioning of our union. The affirmative action one is interesting. The public's views have evolved on this. A among all respondents in New York Times polling, on affirmative action in higher education, 69% say that private colleges and universities should not be able to use race as a factor in admissions. That is a really strong result in today's polling environment. And that includes a majority of Democrats. It includes a majority of African-American respondents with the same pattern pretty much follows across these other rulings. It's a 50-50 split on the student loan question. I've already alluded to the fact there was a 51-49 split on the free speech, the creative 303. I just want to talk about the affirmative action ruling because, Alicia, you started out the discussion on 303 creative by saying, look, liberals are losing their mind. Let's be clear about this. When you see liberal politicians losing their mind on Twitter, it is largely performative. That is how you raise money these days, people. You do it because the base of the party kind of demands it, or your fundraisers think it's what the base of your party demands. You need issues that feed the beast and that stoke outrage and that turn into, hey, let's donate. I wouldn't take that as a barometer of how Democrats feel about rulings like this, or Republicans when rulings go the other way. I think the affirmative action one, I'm concerned about it, because I do think there is a little bit of an overwrought reaction. I covered this with a policy expert on this show at the end of last week. What I think is interesting about this is that we're talking about only one in four colleges or universities that use race as a factor in admissions at all. We're pretty much talking about the most elite. We're talking about the Ivy League. And what we're talking about is a ruling that actually explicitly still allows those institutions to use race as a factor in admissions, just you have to do it through the essay, which in a way I think is the stupidest way to do this because now it's creating an incentive for everybody to find a way to highlight their race as the most salient characteristic of their struggle, of the things that they've had to overcome, the things that might show that they have extra grit in their personality. That's probably true in many cases, but it's a terrible way to evaluate incoming college students. And it just leads me to the conclusion that the entire higher ed admissions system is fundamentally broken and it needs a tear down and a rethink from the get-go. Alicia, you have college-age kids. Thoughts? 
Yeah, look, I- I'm lucky. We've got a college. She's going to college in this coming fall, and she was Miss Smarty Pants involved and everything. So I'm not sure we had too much difficulty with the admissions process. Because I will say, I saw she applied to like 12 different colleges, and the questions they ask are so flawed. They're about what's your cultural background. And if you want to write about that's one thing, you pick what's interesting to you. And college admission people are going to not only judge what you write, but why you chose to write what you did. And that's always been the case. And I'm sure it's always been the case that there are people who are members of racial minorities. They use their history and their personal background and discuss it in essays. So nothing's changed in that respect. And we're talking about a situation here, Paul, where if you look at the Ivy League schools, you are an alumnus of an Ivy League school. If you look at the Ivy League schools and you look at the proportion of black students on campus, it's shockingly, sadly low. It is low. And so we have a system of race conscious admissions that is producing 4%, 5%, 6% African American students on campus. And the reaction seems to be oh no, we've lost this policy that is failing. And what we're talking about is a very small sliver. If you want to talk about inequality in society, I agree that entrance to the kind of elite swath of society is very important. And we need to make sure that there is a quality in that admission. If there's a door here, through this door, you get like elite status in society. Yes, we need to make sure that there is absolute equality in African Americans and people of all races being able to walk through that door. But the policy, the system we're using is failing. And it also is just a tiny sliver of what we're talking about when it comes to a quality of opportunity in this country. How about the millions and millions of African Americans in this country who are not in the position to attend one of these elite colleges and universities? What about equality for them? So to me, I just think we're focused on the wrong problem. But I am ranting at you when you're about to give an intelligent analysis. Not really intelligent. I'm a graduate of Dartmouth College. I applied to Dartmouth College at a time in the far distant past. 1968 is when I applied to Dartmouth College. And as it happened, I was a Jew from New York. They had a small Jewish quota. That helped me because they decided to take a couple of Jews and I got in. And I was a legacy student because my old man went there. And I was not ready for college by any stretch. My interview was a joke. I went down to Wall Street because I lived in New York City and some stockbroker who, uh, as far as I could tell, majored in beer pong. Inter- interviewed me and asked me what I like, what my favorite beer was. So I got in as a legacy, a few Jews to Dartmouth College. So now we're facing lo- a new lawsuit about college admissions from folks saying that colleges can't use legacy admissions anymore because legacy admissions favor mostly white people who've already been there because in the past, since most alum alums were white, the legacy means mostly white people. Again, my point here is just that I understand the umbrage at what seems to be the Supreme Court taking away a tool that's promoting diversity. But I think what we agree on in this group is diversity is important. And we agree fundamentally that, again, There is a door. This is a doorway to opportunity and advanced elite status in our society and income in our society, these Ivy League schools and other elite colleges and universities. And they have control, the keys, these institutions. And they have been following a policy that is producing shit results, okay? They're following the the current race-conscious admissions policy is producing crappy results. Look up the statistics. 8% across the Ivy League, 7% at your alma mater, Dartmouth. The proportion of college-age Americans who are eligible, 15% African-American. So they're hitting about half of what they should proportionally in the United States. Their policy is failing, and yet the reaction is, oh, we have to keep that. Otherwise, America has become racist. My point is, let's tear the whole thing down and rethink from the get-go. Let's get rid of the legacy admissions. I'm sorry to my own kids because they would benefit from such a thing, but no. And finally, I will just say that I attended Swarthmore College. The usual reaction to that when people find that out is they say to me, isn't that a women's school? And then I get my choice of reply quips. The one I usually go with is, wait, 
oh my gosh, that explains so much. Anyway, let's finish off with, let's finish off with some straight politics. Alicia, Paul, we didn't get a chance, the three of us, to talk about the show I did with Neil Levesque, the executive director of the St. A's Institute of Politics. They did an outstanding poll last week that showed Donald Trump absolutely positively crushing the rest of the field. And yet, when I put it out as a podcast, I said, look, it's good news for Trump, but it's actually even better news for Joe Biden, because essentially what the poll shows is that Donald Trump is running away from the field in the Republican primary, and yet Joe Biden is beating him handily. And most important, the thing that really stood out is there are no messages about Joe Biden that resonate and move voters into the Trump camp, except for some concern about Joe Biden's age. This led me to two predictions. One, that you are going to hear a lot from Republicans about Joe Biden's age, because they know deep down this is the only attack that has a chance of working. And number two, this is going to be the most vicious, negative, predictive, pick your synonym campaign in American history, because when you are losing a race, you go negative. It's the only shot you've got. And now, Alicia, you were saying right before we got on the air that there is this ad that Ron DeSantis is running that is... I don't know, bad. Do you want to tell people about it and answer the question? Is Ron DeSantis looking at all this polling and is he just, is he flailing? I don't know what's going on. It, I don't know what's going on. It, it's the strangest ad. I urge people to look up. It was released by the DeSantis war room. First of all, it's very poorly produced for a presidential level, even if it's the political action committee. The best way I can describe it is anti-trans. And I'm not sure why you would do an anti-trans political lad running for president. It's this strange, loud music, booming sounds, audio of Donald Trump affirming he would support rights for the LGBT community. And then headlines about how, which they're bragging about, the most draconian laws passed by Governor DeSantis on trans rights in Florida, as though that's a good thing. And then it interjects buff, sweaty men without shirts on, flashing in between pictures of Ron DeSantis, which I totally oh my don't understand. It, it's so it strange. Schmitz gay. Remember that? Remember that SNL ad with with Adam Sandler from like no. the early '90s? Oh my gosh, this was so funny. It was actually it was so far ahead of its time. It was Adam Sandler and Chris and Farley. They show up at a pool and it's all broken down and it's like empty, like some, someone's backyard pool. And they're like, we need to really rev this situation up. And they clink two bottles together and it's Schmidt's gay. The beer if, if for people who like to drink beer and you're gay. <laughs> and then a whole bunch of sweaty topless men show up and they're, they're partying. So basically what you're telling me is that Ron DeSantis put out a homoerotic and yet anti-trans ad is what yes, you're telling that, That's how I would go with it. And here's my thing. I'm like, so what is the message here? Donald Trump, vote for me because Donald Trump says he's going to protect LGBTQ rights. Oh, and here's a hot, sweaty guy. It's not so me, but there's so one. I don't understand. I just don't understand it. The what answer me is he's flailing. He's basically flailing. The answer is Mickey. He's afraid Mickey Mouse is gay. And he wants to, <laughs> he really wants to protect America from that gay Mickey Mouse. Listen to that high squeaky voice. Listen to the way he talks. Oh, you yeah. you got to know if you're Ron DeSantis, you're protecting America from the invidious Invidious invasion by gay mice of hey, Florida. Paul, there you, you go. Did you design my wedding website? Hold exactly. On. Exactly. I'm Ron DeSantis, and I'm standing up against gay mice. So what so, you're saying is, if Mickey were to get married to a Donald all Duck, kinds Daffy. of problems there, that's cross species. I don't yes. know if you can do that. You can't what have saying, Paul well, will than... not design the website. That's cross right. Career. Oh, you want to blow conservatives' minds? You have Mickey Mouse marrying someone from a different cartoon universe. Who mm. mugs bunny mm. together? No, not mm. allowed. No, no, don't you start messing right. with that. Listen. Do you know on a trivia question the other day I just learned? Do you know why Walt Disney chose Mickey Mouse as his little icon? What? Because he was terrified of mice. Uh, just learned that in a trivia game the other day. Uh, Mickey Mouse deep, is terrifying. Deep psychological. Deep psychological. I, there's this great <laughs> South Park episode where Mickey Mouse beats up the Jonas Brothers, and I just used it in a yes. Blue Web video clip. It is so funny. I would use that clip in every single video I ever put out till the end of time. It's just Mickey Mouse kicking Nick Jonas's butt and going, you don't talk to me like that, you little piece of shit. Anyway, it's so fantastic. <laughs> we've jumped the shark. People, we've jumped the shark. All right, Paul, you need to go have a Bahama Mama. Alicia, I would suggest a refreshing glass of Schmidt's Gay. I'm Matt Robeson. We will see you next time.